Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Medical Fitness Podcast. I'm Jeff Young, and I'm joined in this episode with my co-host, Dr. Thomas Hammett. Our podcast is brought to you by the Medicine, Rehab, and Fitness Institute and JY Kinesiology, LLC, both of which are dedicated to medical fitness education and building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness. You can learn more at mrfinstitute.org. Purpose of our podcast is to provide you with principle and evidence-based content on all things related to exercise science, strength and conditioning, medical fitness, and building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness. In this episode, my co-host Thomas interviews me about what led to my passion for building the bridge between medicine, rehab, and fitness, and I have some interesting experiences that are worth your time to hear about. He also asks what led to my passion for teaching and how the confidence shift occurred as I moved through my career, the purpose of our podcast, why you should subscribe to it, and what you'll learn by tuning in, and a few other nuggets of information. Let's dive in and learn more about what makes Jeff Young tick and why our podcast is worth your time. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Medical Fitness Podcast. My name is Thomas Hammett, and this is my first time in the interviewer's seat today. Um, I'm actually here to interview the host of this show, Jeff Young. Uh, first, I want to tell a little story about how Jeff and I met um, and why I get to be the guy sitting in the chair today. Um, so about, wow, it's almost been four years ago, Jeff. Um, I was in pursuit of someone who had exercise knowledge at a level that was both complex and simple. Um, and what I mean by that is someone who knew a lot of the details about why you prescribe exercise to people in a medical population in a specific way that was repeatable, um, that you could predict, that you could teach. And um, you know, I was working with this hospital in, uh, in Jacksboro, Texas, if any of you ever heard of Jacksboro, Texas, and came across um, your name from a friend, actually, that works at that hospital, um, who's named Joe. And Joe pointed me to you and said, hey, man, you got to meet this guy, Jeff. He, uh, he knows all kinds of stuff related to exercise that I think could really help you in your message. So, um, man, uh, we connected over social media and have been working together ever since. Um, I'm finding it to be a privilege today to interview Jeff. And uh, yeah. So here he is, Jeff Young. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much. This is really cool. And it's uh, uh, an interesting situation. Let me actually um, inter or piggyback off of what you just said and say that one of the first times we met, it was either the first time or the second time, I think, you were presenting to a group of physical therapists and you allow and you live stream me in. And so from my standpoint, like, Joe had already been talking about how amazing you are. And then, you know, that was just a really great introduction because I got to see you right away instead of like this type of atmosphere where we're just talking and getting to know each other. I got to see you, what you do professionally. And, um, and so, and you've heard me say this to you a million times in the two plus years we've known each other. Um, I've been working alongside physical therapists for a couple of decades now. And I knew right when I was listening to you uh, in that presentation, this guy's different. And I need to connect with this guy. So the feeling's absolutely mutual. And, uh, and you know, I just appreciate our friendship. And, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what you have to say and yeah. move on with this, with yeah. this uh, talk. Yeah, what's what's funny, you know, so Jeff and I, before I get into asking you hard hitting questions, Jeff, um, you know, you and I have been talking about doing something like this for a long time, right? And, you know, initially, we had talked about there being some like some banter back and forth as the disagreeable fitness professional and physical therapist, like that would be a dynamic that would really work for us. And I'm afraid that, you know, that's just never worked out. We've got like this kind of funny cross country bromance thing going on where like we try to conflict with each other, but really in the end, we just end up agreeing with each other or building off each other in a different way. So, um, you know, maybe sometimes we'll fight, but I, I don't think it's probably very likely on this show. So which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what I'd love to, to give you the chance to do Jeff is the host of this show. 
Um, I really think it's important for our listeners to get to know you. Uh, it's the whole point of flipping the script today and having you sit in the, uh, the interviewee seat. Um, I'd love it if you could just give us a quick professional background of what's led you to where you are today. Yeah, uh, the short of that is that I wear a lot of hats. They're all very related. Uh, I own a small company here in New York City called JY Kinesiology LLC. One of the things I do is I implement and oversee the medical fitness and post rehab services at a physical, it's a physical therapy facility by name, but it, we have a physiatrist there, chiropractor, occupational therapist, um, acupuncture. So it's, it's definitely a little bit integrated from a rehab and sports medicine standpoint. But my role prior to the pandemic was I really wanted to build this, you know, business there. Uh, but then the pandemic, I, I think I got started there in about 2018. And the pandemic really ruined that. And I, I was forced to um, reinvent myself. So I do still um, have that on in on site business, but it is fading. Um, I also have a through JY Kinesiology LLC, a virtual medical fitness services that I'm now trying to build, which maybe we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit later, maybe not. Um, I started ad, as an adjunct lecturer um, at a, in the CUNY system, so the City University of New York system. There's like 25 or so institutions, and I teach at CUNY York College in Queens. Uh, last semester was my first time doing that. This is something I really want to evolve into, it being a, a, you know, I love being in academia and being a professor. Um, so I taught a sports medicine and rehab course in their movement science program to mostly seniors. Um, and then starting this fall, I'm going to be teaching the same course and adding a strength and conditioning course to it as well, or a separate course that is that I built from scratch. So I do that. Um, there's a company called LNG Canada, which I was contracted out almost exactly a year ago. Uh, well, no, I got I got involved with it about a year ago. I wasn't contracted out till later in the summer. But I've been involved for about a year, and uh, LNG stands for liquid natural gas. It is a $40 billion project um, located in Kitimat, British Columbia. And my role is to create and then lead the exercise component for a corporate health program that, uh, and more specifically, what I'm doing for the most part is I created a um, compre comprehensive video educational library for the corporation um, on pretty much all things related to flexibility programming, aerobic programming, and resistance training programming for both the apparently healthy and for those with chronic disease and, and musculoskeletal issues. Um, I'm a grad student, so that's crazy too to be teaching and also um, experiencing the, the student side. So I'm in school uh, pursuing a master's degree in exercise and sports science. Um, with a concentration in strength and conditioning. I'm weeks away from being halfway through the program, anticipated graduation in December. Um, and I know there's something else, but I can't currently remember. So it's basically professor, student running this business, our MRF uh, Institute website, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit that is actually in the process of being built out. Um, oh, and then two other quick things. One is I chair the NSCA's special populations special interest group, um, which may, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about just a little bit. And I also am president elect of the American College of Sports Medicine's Greater New York Regional Chapter. So I do a lot of volunteer stuff, um, some academia stuff, some business stuff, and some corporate health stuff. But it, it's all intertwined with each other. So it, even though it's, it's a hat and a bunch of different things it's actually not that challenging from uh because it's all just related to exercise and medical fitness yeah so and you know since you didn't have enough on your plate you decided let's start a podcast too because um <laughs> you needed something else exactly. to tap onto that list exactly yeah that's good yeah. yeah um so and maybe what i'll do is start at really even just the most simple level i think probably the people that have stumbled upon this podcast have an understanding of what um, to some degree, what, what medical fitness is, but I think that there's still a lot of defining that terminology that that's happening in our field right now. 
Um, and I think it's really integral to understanding who you are is what your belief of what medical fitness is. Do you mind, but you know, before we even start talking about education, because I really want to get into that, but can you just share with me a little bit about uh, like your background in building this medical fitness business and what, like what that term medical fitness means to you, what you hope it can be? Yeah. So, um, I've also learned, I got involved with medical fitness in 2006. Prior to that, I'd never heard of the phrase. Since that time, since I do a lot of like guest lecturing too, um, in colleges and universities, um, I've, it's one of the things I always ask at the start of one of my guest lectures is how many of, and these are exercise science students and mm -hmm. kinesiology students. And I always ask how many of you by show of hands have heard of the phrase medical fitness. And it's usually either no one or one or two. So even though, so it just shows that you, and I'm so glad you asked the question because it shows that people don't even know what it is. And um, so, yeah, so, so I don't think that there's a, like a consensus definition on it. The way I define medical fitness is that it is the proper assessment, prescription, programming, and, um, and progression People, there's two categories for people with chronic disease and for people with uh, musculoskeletal conditions, but that it also includes the effective and efficient collaboration with medical professionals. And that's part of what makes it medical fitness. So it's not just programming for people with, with conditions, but it's also the collaboration with the clinicians that goes along with it, which is just not happening. Um, and so that's, and that's really what drives my passion, but that's, that's how I go about defining it. Yeah, for sure. So on one hand, it really is the almost taking like a scientific approach to prescribing exercise for people, right? Going through the entire process of building a program for someone with the scientific method. And then on the other end is that only matters if we can integrate fitness professionals into a medical, um, into a medical system, right? Which means working with other medical professionals um, like myself as a physical therapist um, and finding ways to build, just build a bridge between fitness and any, any type of medical profession that you can, right? Um, so maybe that's where I want to jump to next is that um, you know, you've talked a little bit about that second part, you know, needing to build the bridge um, and bridge the gap between medical prof professionals and fitness professionals. In fact, I'd say it's probably your singular greatest passion as a professional, um, yeah. for anyone who may not have this on their radar, can you share why this is important to you? By the way, most people looking for the services of a fitness professional are really just looking for information on how to get started on the right path, not to pay for training sessions every week for months or years on end. For the 60 to 70% of people with chronic disease and or joint pain, they're also looking for someone who can help them develop a clinically safe, individualized exercise program that takes their conditions into consideration. If you're interested in getting yourself or for clinicians, your patients started on a safe, cost-friendly medical fitness program, you can find more information about the virtual services we offer at mrfinstitute.org services. We staff only degreed kinesiologists and exercise physiologists and will work with your healthcare providers in the design of your exercise program for the clinicians listening in, you can add this virtual service as a reduced cost option for your patients. Check out our website and send us an email and we'll give you the details about this unique and much needed service. Yes, so there's a story behind this. And I'm also glad you're asking this question because it's a story that some people know, but that now I have the opportunity for a lot of people, hopefully, to know this story. So. It's 2006. I am 10 years into my career and it's right place, right time. I'm in a meeting with a physiatrist who at the time was the head team physician and medical director for USA Women's Rugby. And another physiatrist that she worked alongside uh, walked into the meeting. I had met him a couple of times prior to that, but only knew him well enough to shake his hand. And I'm sorry, not to, to say to shake his hand and say hi. I'm sorry. And um, so, anyways, he asked what the meeting was about. She tells him, and then he looks at me and he says, "You need to call me tomorrow." And so I call him the next day, and he said, "We have a facility that's under construction 
they they were located on the second floor of this building, and um, he said we have a we have a facility that's look that's under construction on the first floor. That I was originally just going to have to be a physical therapy facility, but how would you like to come on and create a medical fitness component? Um, so this is when I first learned that medical fitness was even a thing. He at the time was on the board of directors for the Medical Fitness Association, uh, and he actually is the one who started their physician track. So he was all about medical fitness. So in any case, um, so this is how I got involved with it. This was a Beth Israel, a Mount Sinai Beth Israel facility. It wasn't at the main hospital. It was a satellite location. And so here I am being brought on as the, the fitness coordinator and knowing nothing about this world that I'm getting ready to enter. And he told me, uh, I hope that you don't mind getting busy because we're getting ready to you know, refer a ton of patients to you. Those were his exact words. So he set an expectation in my head that, oh, wow, this is going to be great. I'm going to be you know, in this hospital setting. I'm going to get busy, et cetera, et cetera. And so I start there and two, two things happen. One is that my ignorance was exposed. I'm 10 years into my career, but you know, with, an, you know, with you having an undergrad in exercise science that we don't learn how to design programs for people with you know, across the spectrum of chronic disease, and especially with musculoskeletal conditions. So here I am, the founding fitness coordinator, and they realized within days, really, a week or two, that, oh, this guy doesn't really know what he's doing. And they were kind of afraid to refer to me. But also, it just wasn't happening. Like, I wasn't getting busy. So I had this expectation that they were going to refer, and then it wasn't happening. So now, flash forward, you know, um, my inner ignorance was exposed. I took that as a challenge um, and something that I wanted to show them that I'm not, I'm not the person that I seem to be right now. So I became a sponge, fortunately, you know, attending the, the in-services, um, all, all the staff developments that we had, the can I was constantly picking their brains, why this, why that, et cetera, candid conversations. And I was also really starting to get involved, uh, uh, getting into, um, you know, staying current with research, something I had never done and getting on PubMed. Um, and and they, they kind of instilled that in me as well. And, and, and um, staying current with that. So point is that my knowledge and my skill set were now starting to increase pretty significantly because they're taking me under their wing and they're teaching me. And, um, but, but the referrals still aren't coming in. And so now it's flash forward like four years and I'm not nearly as busy as I expected to be. And mm. I was getting sick of it. So my wife and I moved to Los Angeles and we thought it was going to be a permanent move. There was a list of reasons why we moved. So it wasn't just because of that, but that was actually near the top of the list. I was getting very frustrated with my situation and why, like I'm thinking to myself, I see all these patients coming through, you know, with, because we had family medicine, internal medicine, physiatry, physical therapy. I see all the patients coming through. Why is it just this fraction being referred? And we we had hired another trainer um, who also was getting frustrated because they weren't getting referrals. So moved to LA, and now I'm at a place called Westwood Physical Therapy that does it right. And, and referrals were built into their model. So I went from like a four-year experience at a major healthcare, you know, hospital system in New York City where I'm not getting the referrals that I'm expecting. And now I'm at this private practice in Los Angeles and my schedule fills up like that. And I'm not going to get into that whole story, but the, I bring it up because now I was starting to see that there's two sides of this fence. So move back to, to um, New York, get my job back. But now I have, I'm almost like a new person because my confidence level had shot up a lot. Plus I had experienced what it's like and what it means to really, you know, integrate with clinicians and uh, have a uh, the, the right type of collaboration. And I brought that back with me. And, and so when I, when I started back again in this Mount Sinai system, I had a meeting with the medical director and our um, head physical therapist, who was the program director. And I said to them, Hey, this is what we did at, at Westwood Physical Therapy, we should, you know, we should incorporate some of this into our model. Yes, yes, yes. Well, they did for a little bit, but then, and also we, um, a year later, we expanded and we took over another floor in our building. 
N. We added cardiology, patient therapy, dietary, chiropractor, and some other services as well. So we now expanded to like 32 healthcare providers. We had this big, beautiful gym and referrals are just trickling in. And now I'm getting even more frustrated because I'm like, this is ridiculous. They aren't listening to what I, I'm saying. And now we have like a zillion patients coming through. And so many of them would, we had these two glass doors that looked into our facility and they would come and they'd peek in because they weren't used to seeing something like this. What's this big, beautiful gym doing in this cynical, you know, uh, hospital type facility? So in any case, um, it's 2015. And I think it's 2000. Yes, it's early 2015 and it's 630 in the morning. We opened at seven. I get there at 630. Our medical director, who now I knew well, I'd known him for about nine years at this point. And I, I stormed into his office and I slammed the door shut. And I'm not going to name his name, but I basically said, Dr. So-and-so, um, we got to talk. And I said, I've been here for, for eight, nine years now. And I work alongside six physical therapists. And then we have you and the other physiatrists and these other healthcare providers. And the referrals are just trickling in. And I said, if there's a, and we also had another kinesiologist that was on staff. So it was me and a kinesiologist. I said, if there's a problem, if the reason why I'm not getting referrals is because there's a problem with me and my knowledge and skill set, then honestly, I really mean this. Fire me. Fire me today. But if there's if it's not because of me and it's something else, then we need to do something about it. And he said, he said, you're exactly right. It isn't a problem with you. Talk to our head physical therapist, set up a meeting for next Friday, and we're going to talk about this. We're going to have a powwow. So, and then he also told me, he said, go to your, go to our IT guy and have him run the numbers. Um, I'm realizing now that this is actually, as I talk, I'm realizing that this is, was the end of 2015. This was like November. It was the end of the, end of the calendar year. So he said, have, have him run the numbers to see how many referrals are coming in, you know, and how many patients are coming through the doors, how many of them are getting referred to the fitness component, and also who's doing the referring. We had 5,000 patients come through the door doors that year. We had like 90 referrals. If you do the math, it's 0.02%. 0.02% of the patients coming through were being referred. And I worked alongside six physical therapists and hardly any of them were referring. And so he scolded them. We, we had the meeting. He scolded the physical therapist and was like, you know, what's going on here? What do we need to do? And then he, we, we had monthly faculty staff meetings. He said, I want you to lead the, because he was also medical director. He said, I want you to lead the next faculty staff meeting. And I want you to give everybody this information. Um, so I did. And you know what they said, for the most part? They said, they basically blamed themselves. And they said, we get so busy. We forget, you know, we're, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, this, these aren't excuses. You see, you walk through our big, beautiful gym, you know, every day. Um, th these are not excuses. So in any case, I thought that it was a Mount Sinai, our facility problem. That same year, he had asked me to attend a, a Medical Fitness Association National Conference. It was in Orlando. And he said, I'm going to introduce you to the CEO, Bob Boone, and I would like you to get more involved. And at about the same time, ironically, I had met Dr. Ingrid Edgstein, who was doing a, she was on the board of directors for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and she was doing a 30-day PM&R, physical medicine and rehabilitation elective with our medical director and the two physiatrists. And so at the same time all this is happening, I'm getting to know her, and she ended up following that elective and did a 30-day elective with me, and basically said, so, so it gave me the opportunity to get to know her, to show her um, like another thing that I do is I'm a continuing education unit provider for the National Academy of Sports Medicine. So I had all these PowerPoints and courses created. So it gave me 30 days to like go through these PowerPoints with her, um, her to watch what I do on the floor and all this stuff. And she's like, oh, you know, our organization needs this. We need to get you involved with our organization. So in a very short window of time, like a three week period, I presented at my first Medical Fitness Association annual conference. And then three weeks later, I presented at my first American College of Lifestyle Medicine annual conference. At the, at the MFA 
annual conference, it gave me the opportunity for the first time to talk to fitness professionals, exercise physiologists and stuff like that around the country. And everyone's complaining about the same thing. And I realized then this is not a Mount Sinai thing. This is not a, just a my location thing. This is a nationwide problem. And then flash forward three weeks later, I'm at this ACLM annual conference and there was a meeting. I can't remember the title of the meeting, but there was a meeting where I think they were getting ready to start some sort of working group. And there was like 30, mostly physicians attending this meeting. And like most of the meeting was actually just them going up to the podium and introducing themselves. And so here was the theme. Physician would come up and, and they were they were asked to, to talk about what they wanted to get out of being involved with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine because it was a very um, small organization at that time where there was only like six or 700 members. So what do you want to get out of being involved with the ACLM and what do you want to get out of the fitness portion? Um, so the first physician goes up and introduces himself. I'm Dr. So-and-so from Topeka, Kansas. And I'm really excited about this because I want to learn how to uh, prescribe exercise for my patients. I'm sitting in the back with the executive director for an organization called the American Kinesiotherapy Association. And also another one of their senior leaders was sitting next to her. So it's, it, we're, we're all sitting in the back and one after another, physicians coming up saying, I want to learn how to program for my patients. I want to learn how to program for my patients. I want to learn how to prescribe exercise for my patients. And we're, and I'm not saying anything, but they're being, they're whispering, but they're being vocal. And they're saying, this is our job. This isn't your job. This is our job. And about two thirds of the way into it, uh, MD got up to introduce herself. And she was the director of the Canyon Ranch, like in San Diego location or the Phoenix location. I can't remember which one, but she was the medical director of one of the Canyon Ranch locations. And she got up and she started scolding the physicians and saying, that's not our job. She goes, I'm, I'm director, of, you know, I'm so-and-so MD, I'm director at Canyon Ranch. We have a whole exercise physiology team that we refer to. We need to know this stuff, but it's not our job to prescribe. Our job is to refer. And that is, those experiences, the combination of all that stuff, I'm not getting referred to. It's going on for years and years. I then go to the Medical Fitness Association conference and realize that this is a problem, a systemic problem. Then I start hearing, you know, these physicians saying, oh, we, this is, you know, we want to do this, et cetera, et cetera. I started to realize in a very short period of time, this is a problem. It's a systemic nationwide problem. Clinicians want to take on roles that they shouldn't be taking on. And I'll finish by saying that, you know, that I'm involved with the Physical Activity Alliance, and I'm part of a working group where now I'm actually collaborating with MDs and um, exercise physiologists and, you know, basically clinicians and exercise specialists across the board who are senior leaders for these major organizations. And, you know, this is what we, there's papers written on this stuff now. Um, that, so this isn't like a Jeff Young thing. Oh, listen to this guy complaining. This is a, at, at the national level now, we know this is a major problem and there's, um, you know, we're working on things to try to correct this problem. So yeah, it really stems from bad experiences, to be honest with you. That's just, it's the honest truth. Yeah. You know, and I think um, <clears throat> what probably is not going to take very long for you and I to expose Jeff is that this is a shared situation between the two of us, though we have never, you and I have never worked at the same clinic or with the same group of providers. Um, they, what you're talking about is literally something I dealt with this morning in a clinic that um, that we're working with in um, the, uh, the provider wanted to, uh, we, we had an exercise professional give notice. Um, so we need to fill the position is, you know, my assumption and the proposal that I get from, uh, from the clinic director is, well, you know, why don't we just not rehire an exercise professional? Um, and just let me do the exercise stuff. And, uh, you know, it just is such a classic highlight of what you're sharing, which is, you know, there's this first inherent lack of trust and this feeling of ease that, you know, maybe I, maybe I can just take it. It'll be easier than having to deal with another person, um, which is really just such a shame in this situation. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is, 
as you alluded to, a really complicated issue. There are people writing 100 page papers, uh, doctoral theses on um, on this subject. And, you know, I think we're going to get into each of the topics around why this is such an issue. And, um, you know, even when the scenario is set up perfectly for exercise professionals to be successful, um, it's not. And that's because it's it's loaded into a system that is inherently um, flawed for this situation to work. So um, I really appreciate you sharing your background on that. And um, yeah, just giving us the perspective and, and why that's so important to you. I think your stories are really, really powerful. Yeah, I, and I, I really appreciate that you asked. And I'll add one thing is that my first job out of college was at Duke University Medical Center's Night and Fitness Center. And so so part of this whole story is that you know they had they also had this built into the model, so the so they did refer patients through you know the, the patients saw the medical um, staff and the nutrition staff and 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 then the fitness staff, and so I just kind of assumed since I was right out of college and green and didn't know what was going on in the world that this was how it was. So I already had it kind of instilled in my head that. Oh, this is this is how the medical model works, and then realize you know or learn through experience that no, it isn't how it works. But then mm -hmm. go to Westwood Physical Therapy and oh, but there are places like this that actually do it right. And then go back to Mount Sinai, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I got to see that there actually, and it actually adds to the frustration because you realize that it, it's here and there, like where where you work at Pinnacle, there are pockets of places that do it right which show that it can be done right. So then why is, why is this so few and far between and why is it not widespread? And so, yeah, that's, that's where my passion for this, that's the root of my, that's what fuels my fire and it's the root of my passion. Yeah, well, and you know, luckily I think really a big, I would say one of the major areas of focus for this podcast is gonna be discussing this topic and you know, sharing a little bit more in depth about some of those situations that are successful, um, bringing people on that have the case studies of, you know, this is a successful situation. Um, so I think there's a lot to learn about the ways that this can work and the ways that it often doesn't. So I'm excited to talk to you more about that and to, um, to expose that over the time that we have in, in creating this podcast together. You know, to go back to that 2015 time period, um, and, you know, it may have happened here. It may have actually been earlier than this. I actually personally would have said that I thought this was built into your DNA. Um, but I think at some point in your career, you gained some confidence and, and found passion for teaching. Um, you know, you talked about uh, doing some teaching right now at the university level. Um, I'm really curious if you could tell us a little bit about how that confidence shift happened for you. Um, you know, it sounded like a little bit of you got put in the place where you needed to be a presenter at a conference, but I know you were an educator long before that, even within your clinics. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about how that confidence shift happened and what drives your passion for education, educating others? Yeah, so I love the fact that you use the phrase confidence shift, because mm -hmm. we're also kind of, you know, we've known each other for two plus years, but it's not like it's been 10 or 20 years. And you nailed it, because that's actually what happened is it was a confidence shift. So um, when I was at Penn State, I was involved in this very long strength and conditioning study under the direction of arguably the premier strength and conditioning research in the wor world. Um, you know, at the very least, one of them, Dr. Bill Kramer. And that gave me a ton of confidence. And then I go to Duke Medical Center, which started as an internship. And my big project that I had to do at the end of the internship, I was given sev several choices. But the, what I chose was to do a presentation on periodization and how it applies to lay people because we learn in school that this periodization model, which we can talk about some other podcast or whatever in more detail, but the periodization model we learn in school that it applies just to athletes. And I learned in this study that no, it doesn't. It applies to everybody. And um, so now I'm at Duke Medical Center, which is a medical weight loss facility with people who are sedentary, overweight, obese, morbidly obese. And my project was to um, was to present on periodization for the lay person to lay people. So I, I remember being so unbelievably nervous going into it. 
Um, but I also remember that, you know, it was like a drug, you know, the, the, the high I got from, from being in that presenter position. Um, and then also I learned being there that most, at least in my experience, most people like to know the whys behind things. Even, even those who are, you know, sedentary or, uh, exercise isn't part of their DNA and may even hate exercise, but they enjoyed learning the whys behind things. So that's kind of what started it, but it really, the confidence shift kind of happened with the whole Mount Sinai thing. And when I started there in 2006 and our medical director basically let me know that you are going to be presenting at in services, you're going to be presenting grand rounds and grand rounds for those who don't know is basically like, it's like the hospital phrase for um, a staff development, but it's tends to is typically very formal. It's suit and tie. It's you know an auditorium setting, very formal setting. And um, you know, and, and when he said that, my heart's just pounding. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I'm not going to do grand rounds. I'm not doing in services. Um, and he also said, you'll you'll you're eventually going to co-present with me at, at conferences. So I realized then that it was probably going to be something that I was going to have to do, whether I liked it or not. And um so then that's that's about 2006 2007 in 2010 toward the end of the year is when we moved to LA for a year the girl who took my spot as fitness coordinator I actually did the initial interviewing um and I learned that she was an a uh, continuing education provider for the American College of Sports Medicine a CEU provider I never even knew something like that existed so I actually learned through her what that meant. I didn't really learn a whole lot about the process of becoming one and what your qualifications need to be or anything like that. But I thought, you know, that sounds pretty cool. And I actually, I, I, I'm realizing right now that I forgot to mention something that at about the same time, I'm working out at a, at a gym here in New York City called the New York Sports Club. It's a big chain. And I'm working out with one of the physiatrists who I mentioned previously at the time was the head team physician and, and medical director for USA Women's Rugby. So we were working out together twice a week and we got to know the fitness manager at this um, facility. He got to talking to us and, and next thing you know, I'm, he's asking, you know, where do you guys work? What do you do? So I'm kind of like boasting about her um, and what she does and everything. And then she starts telling about me, I'm the fitness coordinator and stuff like that. And he looks at me and he said, um, would you like to give a, a presentation to my staff sometime? And I said, sure. So a week or two later, I'm presenting on periodization to fitness training staff. And it's just, you know, complimentary session. Again, it was like, it was like a drug for me. It was like a high. And I, it was actually in a way of a, not a great experience because I had a trainer there who was like a bad apple and was like trying to stump me and ask, make me look stupid. At least that was my perception. But anyways, um, I, Presented there about two or three more times. This particular fitness coordinator then moved to another location. I thought that that was going to be it. But then he sends me an email and he said, um, hey, I'm in a new location. I have a great staff here. Would you like to present here? I did. I realized then I'm kind of in the system because I, I was experienced enough to know that I can start dropping his name at other facilities and I can start presenting it at like the Grand Central location um, and other facilities, which is what I did. That then gave me the confidence to start cold calling and going to the equinoxes, the crunches, and saying, hey, I'm a fitness coordinator in a Mount Sinai system. I'd love to do a complimentary presentation. So I actually, prior to this CEU thing, was building up some experience, but it was all at health clubs. And I also remember, as I'm thinking about this, that if it was more than like 10 trainers, I'd get really nervous. So as long as it was only like six, seven, eight trainers, I'd be okay. But if it was like 12, 15 or whatever, I'd get really nervous. Then I learned about the CEU thing, moved to LA, come back, start to investigate on what it actually means to be, what qualifications you need to be a CEU provider. Became a CEU provider for the American Council on Exercise and the National Academy of Sports Medicine. I did that strategically because um, those are the two biggest health club certs. And so I knew that from a business standpoint, it would be easier for me to get to give these presentations at health clubs um, if I was a CEU provider for these two organizations, which is exactly what happened. So I really started to build my resume through these health club certs. And then to, to wrap this up, then that's when the, the medical director 
who I mentioned previously was on the board of directors for the Medical Fitness Association, that's when he then started um, uh, introducing me and getting me involved with the Medical Fitness Association. I, one, one other thing is I, um, in 2014, I called Penn State and I spoke with my um, former academic advisor when I was a sophomore and junior there and told her I was in this beautiful facility in New York City, a big, beautiful gym. Um, I wouldn't be here, at least partially, if it wasn't for Penn State. If there's any way I can give back, I would love to give back. And, um, and next thing you know, I'm getting emails, like literally the next day or two, asking me if I'd be interested in guest lecturing at Penn State, uh, which was never part of the game plan. And then like a couple months later, one of the professors came to New York City. She was already scheduled for a trip there. Um, and she came and spent a couple hours with me. And so the next thing you know, I'm going to Penn State and I'm guest lecturing. So my answer to your question is it kind of built up with uh, giving these free lectures at health clubs with small groups purposely to try to build up my confidence. Then it was becoming a CEU provider. And once I became one, just the fact that I was able to put that on my resume, raise my confidence, then it was going to Penn State and which was a surreal experience having been a student there. And now I'm in the very classrooms that I took classes in and I'm presenting scared as anything, but the professors are sitting in the back and they're taking notes on things I'm saying. And that's where that confidence shift started happening. I was like, ah, you know, these, these are PhDs and they're taking notes on what I'm saying. Next thing you know, it's UConn. It's Syracuse, it's Indiana University, and it's the same thing. The professors for the class are sitting in the back and they're taking notes. Uh, and then with the Medical Fitness Association, I started presenting there and they're calling me back. And they're wanting me to present at the next annual conference. They're wanting me to present at regional conference, et cetera. And then when all this stuff happens, obviously your confidence is gonna start shooting up. So it went from being scared to, wait, I must, I, maybe I do have some, good things to say and maybe I do have some good information because they keep calling me back so that's where that confidence shift happened yeah you know what I love about how you answered that question you actually surprised me when you started talking about because you've told me a number of times about your connection with Dr. Bill Kramer and um, what I love about how you answered this is because it's different I thought you were going to jump right into the snowballing that you mentioned um, and, and talked at length about but what I love is that you started with this idea that um that it came from a conversation of things aren't as complicated as they seem, right? That, um, that this periodization idea can apply to anyone. And that while, um, while you can look for all kinds of complicated things out there in the world for prescription for people who we call to be in special populations, right? Or people that have chronic disease or comorbidity or um, aren't the performance minded, healthy, active athlete, um, that we don't have to overcomplicate things. And that in and of itself is a message worth teaching. And what I imagine is what enamored so many of the people that you ended up teaching to. Um, so I love that you mentioned that. I love the idea of the snowball effects of um, having you know one experience build off another and starting small. I think anyone who has gone through a meaningful growth and learning experience would identify that that's the path that they took to. So um, just super valuable to hear about your pathway to where you are. I don't know, if, you know, for anyone who is listening, it would be easier to mention the fitness organizations that Jeff hasn't been involved with than the ones that he has been. Um, so thanks for sharing all that, man. Uh, what I, I want to ask one more question related to education. And it's actually because I, you know, in knowing you and knowing both of us in, in that matter, um, I know that this podcast has been created primarily to be a learning resource for people. Um, so uh, what I'd love to ask you is what, you know, what do you hope that people will learn from listening to this podcast? Yeah. You know, in my intro, I say that, um, that the podcast is, is to, I can't remember the exact words I use, but it's along the lines of to, uh, provide information on all things related to exercise science, strength and conditioning, medical fitness, and building the bridge between, um, medicine, rehab, and fitness. And so I want this podcast to be that, you know, a very broad thing where we aren't only focused on, because they all relate to each other. And so, um, so yeah, I want it to be kind of a broad thing where we don't have to always talk about the same topic at the same time, um, or all the time, I should say. 
um, because of, of your network, my network, you know, and, um, and the people that we can tap into and actually have already tapped into in our first two podcasts, um, we have a list of subject matter experts, um, industry leaders and heavy hitters that we're going to be interviewing. So I want people to hear, you know, from some of the giants in the industry and their experiences on all this stuff. But I also know that you and I have a lot of quality content and, and things that we can get out. So sometimes, you know, I'm going to interview you, whether you like it or not. And because I want people to get to know you and your side of the story. And then you and I will sometimes just talk with each other. Maybe even every once in a while, we'll just do, you know, you can just do an individual one or I'll do an individual one. We can talk about programming or whatever, but I want people to, I just know that um, through my experience that programming is like people just aren't confident with programming. Clinicians aren't confident. It's why they always you know what, where can I find the information? You know, it's actually a huge reason why we built the MRF Institute is because they're all, where can I find easily digestible um, information that, that explains to me what you do, Jeff, that explains medical fitness. And so we built a website for that purpose, podcast is for this purpose so that people can um, digest all this information and they'll see as they're listening to it, that there really is a simplicity all this stuff in this complex world where people like to make things complex there's a simplicity to programming to collaboration to doing things the right way um, that's what i really hope to get across with this podcast yeah that's great and since you tapped me in a little bit to this and uh uh threw me in as someone who's going to be part of that you know I, I think something else that and that i know that you're going to agree with when i say this is that yeah, my career has been shorter than yours, and I won't say how much, um, but it's been shorter than yours. And yet, both of us have experienced tremendous growing pains in the, um, you know, in the lessons that we've learned by trying to integrate a model of, you know, preventive health um, into the medical system. And you know, there's a lot of lessons that I'd love for people to be able to learn and not have to go through the pain that we did, um, or at least people that are going through that pain to know that they're not alone and to yeah, have, yeah. have some place, um, you know, <laughs> someone to talk to about their experience too. Um, you know, I think this, this idea of integrating um, healthy lifestyle behaviors into medical pathways, it isn't new, but it's starting to gain some steam right now. And, um, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there that are trying and struggling. And, um, you know, maybe there's a lot of people out there that are, that are trying and being successful. And I would love to hear from those people if they are. Um, but what I know is that there's power in numbers and that we, um, we certainly would want to pass on anything that we have experienced that could help people um, in trying to make this, this thing happen. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and you're interviewing me today, so the spotlight's on me, but I can't wait for the spotlight to be on you. I really mean it. I want people to see what you bring to the table. And I also can't wait until you and I do where we just talk to each other and we just pick a topic and we talk to each other because we know from experience that we just start going on and then, you know, and, and that it's information that uh, at the risk of sounding boastful, which is not the intent that people really should be hearing. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I'm hoping. That's great. Um, you already mentioned the MRF Institute. Uh, do you want to give any further plugs to that or anything else that we can mention about you, Jeff Young, as the uh, the person in the spotlight today and not the person that has to do the interviewing? <laughs> I'll just briefly say, we can talk about it in more detail in future podcasts, but I will just briefly say, you know, mrfinstitute.org. Um, it's actually a little bit under construction. It was initially, you know, if you go there, you'll see that it's a kind of, it'll, it'll probably look like a content dump because that's actually what it was um, initially. But uh, I have some, some meetings coming up. Um, actually, one of them's tomorrow and it's gonna initiate a better change to the website. But if you go to the website, you'll see that um, the homepage is, is Thomas and I and, and our background and bios, but there's a there's a services tab because I, uh, I like I mentioned um, at the beginning of this interview, I have created a virtual medical fitness services uh, to try to capture the 
population of people who uh, don't want to pay as much as it, it can tend to cost um, for a fitness professional. And maybe they don't even want to train with a fitness professional for a long period of time. They don't want to spend the money to, to train two or three times a week for months or years on end. Um, and instead, they actually just want to know what, what it, uh, they just want the information and the education to get started on the right foot. And, and so that's the purpose of um, my virtual medical fitness services. So there's a tab on that. And then there's tabs basically for education for physicians and advanced practice providers, um, physician assistants and nurse practitioners, a tab for physical therapists, and a tab for um, fitness professionals, all of which is educational stuff. Some of it's free, some of it is paid, like for instance, for the fitness professionals, it's CEU content is included. So that's stuff that they would pay for in order to be able to maintain their certification. Um, it's, it's National Academy of Sports Medicine accredited CEU content. And then there's a podcast um, tab for, so people can go and either listen to our podcast aud uh, from an audio standpoint, or we have it on YouTube. We also have it on Spotify. It just got approved through Apple the other day. So this is now an Apple podcast. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what the website is. But again, it's really for education on all things related to exercise science, strength and conditioning, building the bridge between medicine and fitness, same thing that our podcast is about. And it's and it's a one-stop shop. That's what we want. That's kind of the one of the taglines on the website. We're a one-stop shop. Uh, of all your medical fitness needs. And so there's my plug for the, for the website, which will awesome. definitely improve in, in, uh, in the way it's set up over the course of the next several months. That's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing about that. It's excellent resource. Again, mrfinstitute.org. Um, Jeff, it's been a pleasure interviewing you today. I look forward to uh, being out of this seat or at least being co-pilots in this seat with you in the future. <laughs> um, thanks so much for taking some time to introduce yourself to everyone who um, hopefully will have a better understanding of this podcast moving forward after having a little bit more insight as to who you are and, and what, uh, what your lens is going into this thing. So thanks, man. Yeah, and thanks for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And um, next week, we're going to be flipping the script. So I'm looking forward to that as well. All right. I hope you enjoyed listening and found my story at least a little entertaining. I'll be flipping the script in two weeks and interviewing Thomas so you can learn more about his background, why he's honestly the most amazing physical therapist I've ever met, why I'm fortunate to collaborate with him, and why it's worth your time to get to know him as well please go to mrfinstitute.org and our YouTube channel at the Medical Fitness Podcast for more information on how to learn more about the education we offer. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you in the next episode.